<laughs> Hi, you guys. How are you? Pretty good, but that thing is live, so just so you know. So <laughs> it doesn't show Rondo, how's it going? Oh, 
Well, that's actually
Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see all of you in the Lord's house today. And welcome to our visitors back there. Uh, good to see you guys back there in church. Okay, so um, today is one of the Sundays in Pentecost. I think it's the second Sunday in Pentecost. And um, we will be focusing on the Word of God. The, 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 the whole season of Pentecost is focusing on the work of the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit work? He works through means. He works through the means of grace, the gospel, in word, and then also in sacraments. So today we're going to be focusing on how important the, the Bible is, how important the word is, and how we as Christians want to keep that word pure by avoiding false teachers. So as you've noticed, there's uh, you know we don't have hymnals. Those of you that have hymnals brought from home, um, all the words for the liturgy will be on the screen today. We will not be passing the basket for um, offerings. There's an offering plate by the door. Let's see, what are some of the other um, announcements? I guess that would be it. I'll leave some of the other announcements for later on after the service is done. So, Okay, once again, good to see all of you. Let's begin with the first hymn, How Precious is the Book Divine.
prayer of the day. Oh God, you rule all things in wisdom and kindness. Take away everything that may be harmful and give us whatever is good. We ask it through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation, may be seated as we pay attention to the first lesson. So remember the main thought for today's worship service, and that is the tremendous value of God's Word, staying close to God's Word, the Bible, and keeping the Bible pure. So our first lesson is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 11, and we're going to be starting with verse 18. And uh, these, of course, will be the words of Moses to the Israelite people. He says, fix these words of mine. Now he's speaking, obviously, for God. So God is really speaking through his prophet Moses. Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Teach them to your children. Talking about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. And when you lie down and when you get up. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be many in the land the Lord swore to give your ancestors, as many as the days of the heavens are above the earth. See, I am setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing, if you obey the commands of the Lord your God that I'm giving you today. The curse, if you disobey the commands of the Lord your God and turn from the way that I command you today by following other gods, which you have not known. So that, dear friends, is our first lesson from the Old Testament. So um, let me just read the theme verse for today, and then we will sing the psalm. If I can find the theme verse here, it's from Psalm 119, verse 105. Hallelujah, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. Hallelujah. And we will continue our... Hearing and presenting of God's word with Psalm 78. <laughs> Directly 
uh, affect our main theme. Nevertheless, it's uh, from God's Word, so we treasure it. Romans 3, 21 and following. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. And here's the key verse. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So that's our second lesson. Already read the verse of the day. And will the congregation please uh, respond? Do, can we play this response to the to the word of the day or the passage of the day? Gretchen, hallelujah, hallelujah, these words are written. Yeah. Can we do that now? Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and respond with, the, with these words. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire, Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you, Away from me, you evildoers. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house. Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So those are the words of our gospel.
congregation please rise as we listen to the sermon text again? So dear friends, the sermon text is taken from the gospel lesson, so you heard the entire gospel lesson before, but this is just a portion of it. So once again, it's the words of Jesus Christ to his followers regarding the importance of keeping God's word pure. Matthew 7, 15 and following. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. So those are the words that we'll focus on today. Dear friends, please be seated. In the name of Christ Jesus, dear fellow believers, you know that it's my custom usually to start a sermon with a, with a question, just to sort of get the gears moving a little bit. So the question that I have for you is, are we in danger of losing the Bible? I'll repeat it again. Are we in danger of losing the Bible? I guess the obvious answer to that would be no. Because the Bible is still the best-selling book in all the world. I have some statistics here that I got off of the Internet. Of course, you know the Internet is always right, right? Um, annual sales of all versions of the Bible routinely tops 425 million. Next fact, over 100 million Bibles are printed every year. Consumers in the United States will purchase 25% of those newly printed Bibles every year. U version, I'm not familiar with that. Any of you guys familiar with U version? Okay, so U version, a top downloaded Bible app for mobile devices, has over 100 million total downloads and counting. It was one of the first 200 apps that were available on iTunes, it's also been a top 100 free app for three consecutive years. So are we in danger of losing the Bible? Based on those statistics, we'd have to say no, the Bible's just floating around everywhere. But I think you know where I'm going with this. Are we in danger of losing the right understanding of the Bible? The answer to that I think would be absolutely yes. We have many, many false prophets. I mentioned. Last Sunday, last Sunday was Trinity Sunday, so we were focusing on the doctrine of the Trinity. And I mentioned the false teaching of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And they, they not only don't believe in the Trinity, but they don't believe in the companion doctrine to the Trinity. And that's the dual nature of Christ. So they believe that Christ is kind of a cheap person. He was, he was created by God. He's not the creator. He's... He's a creation. So when God was trying to figure out your sacrifice for sin, he just made somebody to be that sacrifice. That's what they teach. So the Jehovah's Witnesses have lost the correct understanding of the Bible and the correct understanding of our Savior. So then they, of course, go ahead and they uh, propound that doctrine to others. And, of course, there's lots of people like the Jehovah's Witnesses, correct? So... We are in a great deal of danger of losing the Bible in the sense of losing the correct interpretation of the Bible. Every false prophet represents a danger for you and for me. And that's why we have a warning in our text for today. Jesus speaks against false prophets. And that's what we're going to be focusing on in our lesson today. Jesus speaks against false prophets. And there's a couple of parts. There's three parts, actually. First of all, Jesus impress upon us the danger of these false prophets. Secondly, he teaches us how to identify false prophets. And then finally, he tells us how to respond or how to react to false prophets. So we'll consider point number one first, the danger of false prophets. So in our text for today, Jesus Christ, he starts off with these words. He says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. So I just want you to picture that in your mind. That's what Jesus wants us to do. 
you picture a ferocious wolf. I don't remember exactly you know, who published this, but I was on YouTube a while back, and when I'm on YouTube, I like to do nature videos. That's my thing, and I feel it's a safe thing to watch on YouTube. So I was kind of cruising around YouTube, and there was a title there, Wolf Pack Attacks Buffalo. So I clicked it, and I thought, oh, this will be good. And wow, it was, I mean, boy, I don't know if I'll ever get that image out of my brain. Those, those ferocious wolves, it didn't take long, and they had done something to the buffalo, a big, huge buffalo. And I think that they bit it right back in its back leg or something, and then the buffalo collapsed. And then about five or six of these wolves, they just went right for the throat of that buffalo, and they chewed all that hair apart, and finally blood was spurting every place and that buffalo was down. So when I think of ferocious wolves, now that's what I'm gonna think about. <laughs> and I hope you think about that too, that a false teacher is a ferocious wolf. Now obviously a false teacher isn't going after your physical life, but they're going after your spiritual life. And so what they wanna try to do is instill doubt in you so that you do not believe that Christ is your savior. So they're gonna to try to put doubt in your brain about the full and free forgiveness of sins that's provided by Jesus Christ our savior. So you see how dangerous a, a false teacher is. If you're swayed by a false teacher, this could lead to your damnation, right? Could lead to you losing your, your savior and without your savior, you're gonna be lost forever in hell. So the the warning is to be taken very, very seriously by our, by our Savior, Jesus Christ. They are like ferocious wolves. And then there's a lot of them. There's a lot of these false prophets out there, these false teachers. But Jesus says, watch out for false prophets, plural. Prophets, plural. And in one place in the Bible, Jesus says, many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. In the book of Revelation, false prophets are pictured as a swarm of locusts. A swarm of locusts that darkens the sky. And with those words, our Savior is telling us, in your life, in your earthly life, you aren't just going to run across one or two false prophets. You are going to run across thousands of them. All right? So the danger is very real. Now, if... If there are so many out there, you're probably saying to yourself, well, where exactly are they? Well, you have to remember that a false prophet, uh, number one, they're not going to be super obvious. I'm going to come to that in the second part of the, the sermon. So, you, you know, you're not going to be able to just identify a false prophet because he has little horns coming out of his head and he lives at uh, 666 Babylon Avenue. Okay? You know? uh, so they're a little bit uh, harder to identify in that sense. But uh, a false prophet doesn't have to change a lot of the Bible to be a false prophet. All they really have to do is change how many things? One thing, right? And then they're a false prophet. And I, you, some of you are probably remembering the words, the, some of the final words in the Bible, where Jesus, speaking through the Apostle John, says, I don't want anybody adding anything to this book. I don't want anybody taking anything away from this book. Anybody who does that is from the evil one. So a false prophet it doesn't have to change a lot of the Bible. A false prophet just has to change one thing, and then they qualify as a false prophet. And just like a wolf, like a ferocious wolf, you know, those wolves that I saw in my YouTube video, they went for the weakest point in the buffalo's body. And... In my mind, you know, without thinking it through too much, I say to myself, the weakest point in a buffalo's body, he doesn't have any weak points. <laughs> He's just one big ball of muscle. But the weak point was the neck of the buffalo. And just like uh, a natural wolf will go for the weakest point in an animal to bring it down, so it is that these false prophets will go for your weakest point. And those false prophets may not know what your weakest point is spiritually. But you gotta remember, they're programmed by Satan. So they're gonna go, Satan is gonna direct them to, to the weakest point. I remember early in my ministry, 
There was a woman who moved into town. She had three kids, and she was from another Wells church. The pastor called me, and he said, would you please make a call on this woman? She's a Wells member. She moved into, church, into town. She's got three kids. They're all, all three of them are unbaptized. And it would be great if you could go over there and offer baptism and get those kids baptized. But he said, I got to warn you, you know, she's not the strongest member in the world. She's got a lot of weaknesses. Well, I go over there, and I thought something was kind of strange because the driveway was all filled with cars. One of the cars was from another pastor. It happened to be her husband's pastor, and her husband's pastor didn't believe in infant baptism, didn't believe in baptizing kids until they were 12, 13, 14 years old. And so here I was in a situation where I had to argue, you know, for baptism in the presence of this other pastor who was arguing against baptism. Now, the story turned out okay because we won, <laughs> okay, all right? But you can just tell that Satan was going for her weakest point. She was weak to begin with, but then she really didn't believe in in baptizing children because she had three little kids and none of them were baptized. So whatever your weak point is, Satan's going to go with it. You know, if it's if you have troubles being assured of your salvation, Satan's going to go after that. If you have troubles, sometimes you know you you might fall into this belief of evolution because it's out there everywhere, and you say that, ah, you know, I have troubles believing what the Bible says about that, Satan's going to go for that. If you have troubles believing what the Bible says about the roles of men and women in the home and the church, Satan will go for that. If you have troubles with fellowship, the doctrine of church fellowship, you don't understand that, it's always sort of bothering you, Satan will go for that. Satan was always going to go for your weakest point, just like a ferocious wolf. Well, the bottom line is, here, dear friends, is that we aren't any match for these false prophets. We are about as weak as the day is long. And these false prophets are slick, they're smart, they're powerful because Satan is behind them. We are no match for false prophets. Therefore, we need to hang around the shepherd, right? So the shepherd's going to defend us against these false prophets. And sheep are no match for ferocious wolves, but when the shepherd is around, then the sheep are safe. So we got to stay close to the shepherd. And the Bible tells us how to do that, is through word and sacraments. If we hang on to God's word, we hang on to the sacraments of baptism and holy communion, then we're going to be, we're going to remain strong. We're going to pray, too. We're going to use that tool that we have to pray. Dear God, please help me never to fall into the false influence of a false prophet, and so lose my faith. And God promises to answer that prayer with a yes. I have a passage here from Philippians 1 6. He who began a good work in you. So that's what that's talking about God. God started a good work in you. He took away all your sins and then he gave you faith in Jesus Christ. So he started that good work. So he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let's just stay close to the shepherd. One of the things that the shepherd teaches us today, though, is how to identify these false prophets. And as I alluded to before in today's sermon, identifying false prophets isn't easy. And, and Jesus continues to tell us that in our text. He says, they come to you in sheep's clothing. So, as I mentioned before, a false prophet isn't going to look bad. A false prophet isn't going to live at 666 Babylon Avenue. A false prophet's going to look like a very nice person. How many of you, um, well, I better not ask that because we're on, we're on uh, Facebook here. But uh, many of you know that we had a problem here in our church a while back with a family that had some teenage boys. And they fell away and they became Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay, so a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Well, how did that all happen? Well, I'll tell you how it happened. The Jehovah's Witness missionaries came over to their house. They saw the boys out front shooting buckets. And they said, can we shoot buckets with you guys? And they said, sure. So they were shooting buckets. And they played for about an hour. They're all sweaty. And then the little group kind of broke up. But then the next week, 
guess who showed up wanting to play buckets again? It was the Jehovah's Witness missionaries. And then by the time I was alerted to the situation, the father said, but Pastor Spout, you got to understand, these Jehovah's Witnesses are really nice guys. They're just really nice guys. And they shoot buckets with my kids, and they're, they're, now they're friends with my kids. They're just really nice guys. So false prophets are hard to identify because a lot of times they're really nice guys, really nice people. I remember my grandfather. My grandfather was a pastor in Minnesota, of a small, and he was a small town, western Minnesota. And he would go golfing once a week with the Catholic priest and another minister. I don't know what denomination he was. But one time we asked him about that. We said, you know, Grandpa, you know, you're, you're hobnobbing around. You're being big buddies with the Catholic priest and and the whatchamacallit minister. And uh, he said, yeah, they're really nice guys, but they're all false prophets. <laughs> that's what he said. You know, that was a different age when people were more blunt. But, but that's what he, he was having to be able to talk with his grandkids. And he said, those guys, nice guys, but they're false prophets. So how in the world do we identify these false prophets? They're most of the times, they're nice guys. And they are members of a church somewhere probably leaders in the church. A false prophet is going to be a church person. You know, when you go to the zoo and maybe there is a person there that's telling you about the giraffe and they say that the giraffe evolved, you know, 450 billion years ago and came from the zebra or something and you know it's just a bunch of false teaching. That false teacher is not really what we would call a false prophet. A false prophet is someone who's in the, in the church, in the visible church. They come off like they are a church person, see? So Martin Luther, in his day, he clearly identified. He says the Roman Catholic Pope is a false prophet. So um, false prophets are always church people. And that kind of almost adds to their niceness. So they're hard to identify. Well, how do, I, do we identify them? Jesus says in our text... By their fruit, you will recognize them. By their fruit, you will recognize them. So, so what would be the fruit of a prophet? The fruit of a prophet, the fruit of a preacher, would be what he preaches. Okay. So what you're supposed to do is, you're supposed to uh, listen to what that person says and then compare it to the Bible. If it's different from what the Bible, then you know it's bad fruit. And then you know that that person is indeed a false prophet. Now, something I just want to say here in this uh, whole situation of identifying false prophets. A true prophet of God might say something that is wrong. I'll give you an example. Last week, I think it was last week, I said something about China. And I said that 4,000 years ago, there were lots of people, or in 4,000 B.C., I meant to say 4,000 years ago, but I said in 4,000 B.C. there were lots of people in China. Well, that was wrong. Um, because because 4,000 B.C. was the day Adam and Eve were created. Okay? <laughs> so I don't think that there were a lot of people in China at that time. So then one of the members you know, called me and said, oh, just a little thing, Pastor, just a little thing, you know, you, you, you misspoke yourself. And I thought, oh, yeah, I'm really sorry. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a correction. And this is the correction. <laughs> you know? So, uh, you know, a false prophet will be corrected and then they will resist that. They'll say, well, I'm going to keep on teaching the falsehood. A true prophet of God will be corrected and say, oh, yeah, I'm really sorry about that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to retract what I said because I was an error. This actually happened to the Apostle Peter one time. And he was teaching falsely. Uh, about, about Old Testament rules and regulations. And the Apostle Paul corrected him publicly, and then Peter repented publicly of that. So that's a mark of a true prophet, when someone will say, okay, you're right, I'm wrong, I am sorry. But a false prophet guy is going to stick to his guns, and he is not going to take back any kind of his false teaching. All right, so who's responsible then? We, we know how to identify a false prophet. Who's responsible? Are you responsible? Am I responsible? 
Well, the answer is, of course, we're both responsible. As a pastor of a church, I'm really responsible. If I find out that you're under the influence of a false prophet, I'm supposed to say something. I'm supposed to kind of sound the alarm, okay? So I'm really responsible for that. But I can't be with you 24-7, so that's why you have, you're responsible too. I can't, be, I can't be with you all the time as you're cruising around the internet, or as you're watching TV, or listening to the radio, or you go to a Christian bookstore. I can't be there all the time. So you have to also be responsible, and that means that you got to know the scriptures. you got to know the scriptures. Otherwise, it's going to be tough for you to identify a false a prophet. Now, some people kind of throw up their hands and say, well, I can't know the scriptures. The scriptures, it's a big book. I can't know that. But yes, you can. There's about a th about a hundred uh, teachings in the scriptures. Only a hundred. That's not very many doctrines. I'll bet you that over half of you people sitting here, you have over a hundred friends and relatives. I'll bet you, if you, if you put them down a list. I'll bet you have over a hundred friends and relatives. I know the police do for sure. Okay. So if you can know your 100 friends and relatives well, then you can also know the scriptures well too, see? It just means that we need to study the God's word, and uh, that might mean devotions, Bible studies, things of that nature. Okay, that's how we identify false prophets. Once we identify them, then how do we respond to them? This is a very short part of the lesson today. We really get it from the picture that Jesus puts out there. He pictures the, the sheep being attacked by these ferocious wolves, how do we respond? How, how should sheep respond to the ferocious wolves? They should run away, right? <laughs> That's really their only defense. They should run away from that false teacher. We should not entertain false teaching. We should not say to ourselves, ah, a little bit of false teaching, no big deal. You know? Ah, my kids were invited to the vacation Bible school over at the whatchamacallit church. Ah, it's just vacation Bible school, no big deal. You know? Uh, we should run away from false teachers. We should skedaddle. The Bible says in the book of Romans, it's very point blank. The Apostle Paul says, keep away from them. Just keep away from them. Now that, that of course, doesn't mean you keep away from them physically, necessarily. Um, I mentioned my grandfather who used to hobnob around with a Catholic priest and go golfing and stuff like that. So that's okay, but it's to be close to them spiritually, to, to sit at their feet spiritually and say to a false teacher, teach me something. Teach me something about God's word. If we go to a false teacher with that kind of offer, we are opening the door to Satan. Okay, we don't want to do that. The Bible compares listening to false teachers with adultery. So that's like becoming sexually intimate with someone who's not your spouse. And I don't think there's anybody here who wants to do that in a physical sense. We certainly then don't want to do that in a spiritual sense either. Okay, so dear friends, those are the, the lessons that we're learning today from the Word of God. I'm going to ask you the question I asked you at the beginning. Are we in the day? Are we in danger of losing the, the Bible? <laughs> uh, maybe not physically, but we are always constantly in danger of getting the wrong understanding of it. And key to avoiding that trap is listening to true prophets of God. And so our prayer today is, dear Lord, keep us, keep our church true. Keep our pastor true. Keep my family true to the word of God. Enlighten me with your holy word. Teach me more about God's words so that I can identify and then stay away from these false prophets. May that be our prayer today. Amen. Will the congregation please rise? The peace of God which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Dear friends, we will respond to the Word of God by reciting the Apostles' Creed. The words are on the screen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He arose again from the dead, 
He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The congregation may be seated now, and I will uh, now offer some requested prayers. Just an announcement about the prayers. So Rick Alexander, as many of you know, has liver cancer. And it's to the point where his only hope really is to have a liver transplant. And so this past week he was, uh, he was in line to get the transplant. He went all the way down to Madison and then something happened and, and he had to go back. While he's going back, then another person died with a liver that matched. So then he had to turn right back around and go back down to uh, Madison, but then it turned out that when they took the liver out of the person who recently died, the liver was was not of a quality that they needed. Point being that Rick's going through a lot of angst right now. We want to pray for our brother Rick. This is an easy thing for him. Also, there's one of the people that listens to us on uh, Facebook. She's from Florida, and she has a, her name is Jenny. And she has a husband who's going to be having an operation on Tuesday. She asks that we pray for him. Al Melville has a relative, who, a um, young man, who uh, wasn't feeling good. And he went in, long story short, his body's completely filled with cancer. And I assume he doesn't have very long to live. We pray for him. And then, of course, uh, we want to pray for all of the troubles that our country is having right now. So you may remain seated, but let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we pray for our brother Rick Alexander. We ask that you would supply his medical needs, including a liver transplant operation of this be your good and gracious will. Since this is a stressful thing for Rick, we pray that you would keep Rick in your good spiritual care, increase his faith in this trouble, comfort him with the gospel. We also pray for the man in Florida, the, the husband of Jenny. We pray that that... Uh, she, he would have a good, successful operation on Tuesday, a guy in the hands of the surgeon and cause the rehab to be short and effective and keep and guard his faith in the Lord Jesus. We also pray for our relative, the relative of Al Melville, and comfort him with the gospel, either grant him a miraculous recovery or shorten the time of his earthly suffering. He is best in your wisdom. And Lord, we pray for a swift end of the coronavirus problems in our country and all the racial tension of our country. Let the peace of Christ fill the hearts and minds of all of our citizens, especially bless the evangelism and mission efforts of all Christian churches, because we know that Christ and his gospel is really the only solution to all our troubles. And the work of spreading that gospel is our privilege and our duty, so bless our efforts in that way. We offer this prayer in the name of Jesus who taught us the Lord's Prayer. And the words for the Lord's Prayer are on the screen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So our next hymn is My Hope is Built on Nothing Less.
hunger. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation, and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the benediction of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. And the Lord look on you with his favor and grant you his peace.
to have happen is that the rows in the back would excuse themselves first, and then, you know, it's. It, I think the Bible says the first will be last. Doesn't it say that? The first will be last. So you guys are the last, okay? <laughs> and way back there, no one, you're the first to come out. And then you can mill around all you want in the parking lot and visit all you want. Have a great day in the Lord.